Um, I'm going to welcome you to the 2019 Opperman Distinguished Alumni Lecture. The Opperman Lecture was established by the late Dwight D. Opperman. Mr. Opperman attended Dakota Wesleyan in, in the 1940s, 47 and 48. He earned his law degree from D Drake University in Des Moines, Iowa in 1951. He then went on to live a distinguished life as an editor of the West Publishing Company and uh, going on to hold a lot of administrative and management posts until 1968 when he was named President of West, a position he held until 1993. The Opperman Distinguished Alumni Lectures was designed to expose current DW students to alumni who have found success in their professions. I'm pleased to introduce to you Larry Young as our 2019 Opperman Lecture. Larry is a professional speaker, an author, and entrepreneur. He is the founder of Boiling Frog Development, helping organizations imagine their success. Before launching his own business, Larry was a market president for Wells Fargo. Larry is a Nebraska native, lived in South Dakota for most of his life, and currently lives outside of Phoenix, Arizona. He prides himself with volunteering for leadership positions within his church, United Way, <coughs> numerous other nonprofits. He loves to read, play golf, hike, and coach his two sons. Larry graduated from DW in 1994, 25 years ago this year. That's a long time, Larry. That's a long time. Mm. Could be my kids. I know they could be your kids. <laughs> well, some of them anyway, right? But most importantly, uh, Larry is a DW Tiger and a member of the 1992 championship football team. So let's uh, join me in welcoming Larry back to campus. Yes. All right. I'm not used to a podium here, so bear with me. The date was August 20th, 1990, and I was a college freshman, and I was in, I was in fall camp. And now I'm coming from a town of Orchard, Nebraska, where, where I was a big kid, so it was easy to kind of be a big deal, if you will. So now I'm playing on scout team, and I come through the line. I'm playing defensive end. I come through the line, and I'm going to make a tackle on the running back. When I look off to my right, and I see one of the senior offensive tackles about this far from me, it launches me into the middle of next week, which I'm surprised I haven't even landed yet. And he looked at me. He said, welcome to college football. <laughs> so that's how my college started. Now, unfortunately, I didn't think that I was going to stay. I actually, most people, nobody actually knows this story but except for one person. I was going to leave Westland. I had had it. I thought, this, I'm not, this really isn't cut out for me. And so I packed up all of my bags and I waited till all the rest of the football players had gone off to practice and I was going to leave. It just wasn't for me. When all of a sudden I decided I was going to take a little bit of a nap and wait because I wanted to make sure everybody's gone, I woke up and my brother-in-law, Chris, or 2B brother-in-law, Chris, was standing by my bed. They said, what are you doing? And I said, this isn't for me. I don't think I can do this. And to which he, we had a, about an hour-long conversation. He said, wait. Wait around. He said, wait till you get to school. Wait till, wait till everything you get in the role. Football is important, but you're here for a bigger cause. And he told me girls would come too. <laughs> so any of you guys that are on the team, you know during fall camp there's not a lot of girls there. Just with sweaty dudes, right? And so I stayed. I stayed, but you know, at that time I didn't have a lot of faith and I didn't have a lot of proof that it would work out, but I believed in what he said. Have you ever realized that sometimes some of our best decisions in life are made when we don't have proof? So now I'm trying to bring my boys up in the Christian faith years later, and we had this little club. It was called ABC Club. It was Amazing Bible Club. And what we would do is we'd have secret handshakes and we'd talk about Jesus and we'd try to learn. I'd feed them Cheetos and anything to get them interested. But you know how kids are. They'll start asking you questions like, why, why, tell me more, because they want proof. And I realized this at that time when I was prepping for this, that when you think about our Christian faith, God is the opposite of sin. You can't be in sin and be with God. You can't be with God and be in sin. And what I realized that day when I was prepping was something that would change my leadership for quite some time, is that faith is the absence of proof. You can't be in proof and have faith. You think about it, when we make decisions to pivot, we don't always have proof, do we, Amy? 
And so you start to realize over time, I mean, think about it. If you have those, you don't need much more. Think about this. When they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, as an example, just imagine, this is my imitation, but just imagine the guy's like, hey, I'm going to dig a little deeper. And he pulls out a VHS tape. And he goes home and he puts it in his player. And now all of a sudden we have filming of the birth of Christ and the, and the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ. We have this proof. And scientists and theologians and everybody agree this is 100% proof that Christ existed and what he did for us. Do we really need faith anymore? Do we have to have faith if we have proof? What I want to share with you today, I'm going to share with you four stories, some of them a little funnier than others. When I look back, especially to the crowd of students, when I think back 25 years ago, where were the times in my life where I really rocketed in my leadership where I didn't have the proof? And I had to go on faith. That's where I want to go with you in the time we have. So it's 1994. I'm a senior here at Wesleyan. And I'm sitting there, and I'm in uh, Jerry Luckett's class. Is Jerry here? Jerry in the back. Uh, has not changed a bit. So now I've got this presentation that I'm going to give. Now at Wesleyan, there's an irony in this story. I avoided any class that I had to take that I had to do any public speaking. I had wanted no interest in it. I would switch classes if anybody told me I had to speak. But now I'm a senior and I'm in one of these classes and I had to do it. Fine, I'll do it. So here I sat in my class just like this, shaking. And when I looked up from the, my paper, nobody was staring at me. Everybody was staring at the paper in front of me. And I was humiliated. I was over in the Rollins Center. I walked out and I said, never again. Never again will I feel like that. Never again am I going to be in front of a crowd and not be able to speak. I'm going to learn how. The first lesson that I give you is that we learn to jump into our fears. There's an interesting statistic that shows this, this project, uh, Inc. Magazine, looked at CEOs, and they looked at uh, 2,500 CEOs that had been fired from a job. They made a choice that they were fearless, and they went after it. Here's what they found. 91% of them went on to a job of equal or better responsibility. They learned from their mistakes. Isn't that what we do, Amy, yeah. when we're making those? That. Perfect. <laughs> so now it's, the, it's a three days later, this true story. A friend of mine, Andy Schaefer, comes up to me, says, look, we don't have a president here, our, our senior class president. I said, well, why is that? And he said, because the senior class president has to give the speech at graduation. I'll do it. I'll step up, I'll do it. So I became our senior class president. So now I did what all college kids do. I waited till the last moment. Now it's May, I gotta get the speech done. I write out this speech and it's about a page and a half long and then I compress the margins down to about, about so it's about two inches wide. So now it's about six pages long. I cut off the excess. I grab a roll of toilet paper and I roll the thing out and I tape my speech on the roll of toilet paper and roll it back up. Now it's graduation. I'm at the Corn Palace. There's what, 3,000, 3,500 people as a full crowd? And so now I get up there and I do what everybody does, you know, thank the graduating class and thank for the parents and the faculty and everybody's that there. I said, I wanted to go to a place on campus that I could do my best thinking, the place in which I could concentrate the most, and the, and the place on campus that over the last four years I made my best decisions. And I reached into my gown and I pulled out the roll of toilet paper. I grabbed onto the speech. I dropped it over the podium. It rolls down the stage and down the steps. And 3,500 people burst into laughter. And I took off. It's a neat story because it was 25 years ago and they let me come back. So that's good. But what I didn't realize, folks, at this, that time is that something changed in me. Something that changed that I realized that the first lesson I was going to learn leaving Wesley, the biggest lesson I was going to learn, is to jump into my fears. And how we know is on the other side of that is a better version of ourself. That's when we know to jump. I could have never realized, folks, when I left there that day, that I would be doing today what I dearly love doing. And so that, you have to jump into your fears. What great leaders know is that failure is not the opposite of success. Failure is a part of success. True? Awesome. The second thing I learned from that speech is that 
leaders that really accelerate their career, whatever that is, that could be leadership on Wall Street, Main Street, in the classroom, wherever, they take chances. The Genome Project did a study, it took at 17,000 CEOs, and what they found, this will be great for the students, what they found is from the time you get your first job to when you become CEO, the average time is 24 years. But then they went further and they looked at the study and they said, How, who are the people that are doing that in half the time or a third of the time? And they took a look at those. Here's what they found is that those leaders inherited a mess or took over something that no one else would do, which is a lesson I learned that day when I spoke at our commencement address. Nobody wanted to step up. Nobody wanted to be the senior class president. Nobody wanted to talk. So now it's 2005, 2006, I'm sitting in Sioux Falls, I'm a commercial banker, and it's the best of times. I'm hitting all of my incentive, I'm getting recognition, I'm getting, my family's growing, my wallet's growing, I mean, I'm very comfortable doing what I'm doing. And then HR gives me a call and says, look, we've got an opportunity for you. We've got an opportunity in a market where you can become a market president, gives you a chance to bump up, it's more pay, it's closer to home. I thought, well, hell. That sounds like a pretty good deal. I mean, those are not hard decisions to make, are they? So then I went down and talked to my manager at that time. My manager said, well, I just want to be clear that the market itself is not doing well. And some of the team members are not really engaged. They might leave you. And if we don't turn this around, you know, uh, they may close that, which would put me out of a job. I said, well, hell, I'm not going to take that opportunity. I'm happy doing what I'm doing. And then he said something to me that changed everything. He said, but if you can turn it around, you're going to have a load of opportunities. And I jumped. See, I learned that day from the speech is not only to jump into your fears, but also do things. You're going to be presented in life with things that are going to be less than stellar. There are going to be opportunities that will come at you wherever you're doing that maybe just will not feel the same or just feel like, why am I doing this? What I want you to think about is on the other side of that is greatness. On the other side of that is greatness. What I was blessed with, though, in that market, and I told this story at the governor's thing yesterday, and, uh, but I want to tell a little bit more to this crowd. I was blessed with a great team when I took over that market. And I was blessed with people that really wanted to do some good things. But because he's sitting here and I never got a chance to say it, I, I see Pat Essig's in the crowd. Pat Essig was one of the greatest men to ever walk through that large company, ever. With integrity and honesty, and he was the best manager that I ever could have asked for at that time in my life. What Pat did for me is that he made sure that we followed a process to be successful. But here's what I want you to gather from Pat's leadership, and I don't even know if he knows he was so good at it, is that what Pat did for me is that he gave me a blank sheet of paper, and he said, you run it like you own it. You run it like it's yours. He gave me the freedom. I wasn't afraid of failure because he made me safe, and it allowed me to free up and do things that were so great and we had some good times, didn't we, Pat? Had absolutely great times, and he trusted in me. And I say that in front of all you, because we do have to sur surround ourselves. But when you jump into something that's less than stellar, we want to make sure we got good people around it. Like I've always said, change the people or change the people. So you have to be able to put people around you that will make a difference. Cool? The third lesson that I'm going to, that, that I learned along the way, is that we always have to continue to be readers. We have to be learners. When I left Wesley and I had no interest in continuing my reading education, I'm not gonna lie, I didn't wanna study anymore. But what we find is that our great leaders out there continue their education. The greatest CEOs out there will read between 45 to 55 books a year. They're always trying to keep their mind growing. They're always trying to challenge them things. And they do this so that they have increased faith. They have great understanding. If you want to shatter the leadership ceiling, I, this is one of the most powerful ways to, to spend an hour worth of time trying to learn, trying to grow, and trying to culture your mind. I have seen more careers take off by somebody who decided to pick up a book and start reading and start learning. Extremely powerful. So now it's 2012. 
And at that time, I think I had four or five different markets that, that were under me. And we had come off three or four years of just the greatest times. I mean, we were achieving everything. It was goal here and achievement was up here. And it was fantastic. People were getting promoted. It was a wonderful, wonderful time. And then at the end of 2012, we barely hit our goal. So goal was here and achievement was right there. And nobody really thought anything of it at that time. They thought, hey, one slow year out of a couple, that's not really a big deal. And so I did what, what most leaders do. You've ever heard the term work smarter, not harder, right? But we in the Midwest, sometimes we just figure we'll work harder. It's kind of that idea of I do what I've always done, I'll receive what I've always received. So surely if I do more of what I've always done, then I'll receive more of what I've always received. I'll just work harder. So now 40 hours becomes 50 and 50 becomes 60 because I'm not looking for faith anymore. I'm looking for proof. And after all that hard work at the end of 2013, that same collective group of teams, we hit half of our goal. You remember that, Pat? <laughs> half of our goal. It's not comfortable sitting in a review <laughs> when you've hit half of your goal. You ever have those times when the chips are down and now all of a sudden everybody's got an opinion? Everybody's got an idea of what you did wrong, what you should do better, all the yak yak, you got all this noise in your head because everybody thinks they've got a better idea than you. This is when faith shows its head. This is when you need your faith the most to shatter the ceiling. So now with all this talking, I went to a mentor friend of mine and I asked them a question and I said, look, this isn't going well. I, you know, I'm working harder. We're doing the same things. We've all, you know, we're, we're continuing to do the things that made us successful. And he asked me a question that absolutely changed my leadership, and it will change yours. If you remember this the rest of your life, for any of you that are in business or just starting out or whether you're starting out in your career, and it transformed mine, the question he asked me was, when is the last time you did something for the first time? When is the last time you've done something for the first time? Has it been a while? What he was saying to me is that you quit learning, you quit trying, you quit trying to do things that are different. When is the last time you got uncomfortable, read something, learned something to improve your leadership, to try different things? And what happened to me that day is I realized that, that it hit me like a, a punch to the stomach. And what I realized is that one of the biggest killers of success in life is success. I got complacent. I got happy. What I want you to remember with this point is that you cannot stay stuck in your comfort zone when your mind is moving forward. When you're reading and learning and you're going from here, the sky is the absolute limit. I was sharing with the, the class this morning. I taught a couple of classes. I don't know if I taught, but I, I was lectured. Uh, it was kind of interesting. I, I referenced a gentleman by the name of Earl Nightingale. And Earl Nightingale was a motivational speaker some years ago in the 50s and 60s, kind of a pioneer of motivational speaking. And I got some tips from them. One I shared with them is in a different context, but this was extremely powerful. And what Earl Nightingale said is he said that if you choose in your profession, whatever it is, if you choose to read an hour a day, that could be a lunch hour, before work, after work. If you read for an hour a day, in three years, you'll become a regional expert in your, in your chosen field. That means that throughout the Midwest, people are looking to you for your information. They're looking to you for your insights. But then he went on to say, if you did it for five years, you would become a national expert. You would become an expert that, that, that would be on the major networks that people would request that they would want to see you. See, you continue to grow because you're, because you're learning. Well, he went on to say this, and I thought about you, especially the students. It's still applicable for us seasoned crowd, but for the, for, the, for the students, if you went on to do this for seven years, you would be a world-class expert in your chosen field, the top five or six people in the world at what you do. And I think back 25 years ago, and I think, wow, what if I would have told myself that, graduating at, whatever, 21 years old, and by the fact that before I was 30, you could be a world expert in something? Just imagine the career that you could have. 
by being able to invest in yourself to start your life off and say, look, this is what I'm going to invest in. And before you're 30, you'd have those opportunities. Powerful. You believe a little bit in learning, don't you, Amy? I know you read a lot. It's powerful for us. I have seen more careers, as I said, skyrocket by people that chose to pick up a book. People, all of a sudden, they had different perspective that other people didn't have. They started to have answers that other people didn't have. They started to see patterns. I told the group yesterday when I was talking to them that as leaders, you start to see things that other people don't because you start to grow your mind. You start to grow how you look at things. I, said, I told them, I said, the worst time to find out that an employee, your best employee is unhappy is the day they resign. And they all looked at me and I said, by reading and learning, you're starting to see things that other leaders don't. And you can start today. You start to see those patterns. The fourth story that I'm going to tell you is kind of a fun one. So we've been talking about faith. And all of these times being fearless, not knowing the truth. From the time Chris talked to me, the time I did the speech, right, I had no proof that that speech was going to go well heck i it was a i look back on it now it was a terrible speech everybody laughed the only good thing is i think i thank my mother who's sitting back here for all the great that's what people remember some people don't even remember the toilet paper and people were walking up to me after like that's epic man we're never going to forget you heck i don't think there's but four people here that were there. who was there just anybody who was there yeah uh -huh. so yeah so yeah i see the family they don't want to raise their hands they don't want to claim me now but at all of those cases, I had to, in order to shatter that ceiling, I had no proof. When I took over that first market, there was no guarantee I was going to keep my job. There was no guarantee that that was going to work out. But what I understood with that market is that I was going to get a bachelor's, a master's, and a PhD in kicking butt, learning how to take over a market, developing people, and growing. I was going to come out, whether fear or failure, I was going to come out a better person. And that act alone began several opportunities where I become encountered. I see Lori and Jared here. I don't know if there's any others. Of course, Pat, as I mentioned. But I got to surround myself around great people because I took that chance. But the fourth story is a little bit more of faith. It's a little bit more of faith. There was absolutely no proof in this. So now it's about 2013. And I'm out in this. We've got a citywide rummage sale. I'm living in Yankton at the time. Citywide rummage sale. And, I, and, and uh, so I go over to the neighbors. And we're kind of supposed to be watching our stuff. But I'm having a little beverage with him. And I said, you know, the market in Yankton is pretty hot. I said, I could probably put a sign in my front yard and sell the house today. He says, I'll bet you could. So I walked into the house, I told my wife, Tina, I said, you know, we should I maybe think about selling it. I, I just, I think that there's something more. But again, I had no proof at that time what was going to happen. So we debated about it for a week or so. And sure enough, we took out a little $10 ad in the Yankton P&D and we advertised our home. Of course, I'm a sales guy, so it took me four showings. I sold it full price offer, no realtor commissions. And then I went, crap, what are we going to do? I just sold my house. Well, we don't even know where we're going to go. Talk about faith. So my wife and I, we decided, well, we better force something. So we decided to rent an apartment in Yankton, kind of a month-to-month -month apartment. And so we did. And the lady told us that when we got it, she said, look, you got to be out of here by May 15th. Now, keep in mind, this is September 13th. So, so within about four or five months, I've got to be out of there. And this ironically coincided with my boys getting out of school. They were for the summer break. No problem. So now when you're living in faith, a lot of times to my original messages, we get these opportunities where we feel like we're in faith, but we're always trying to force proof. So now I sit there and we kind of didn't really do a whole lot. We kind of sat there and, oh, it's Christmas. We made every excuse why we were, were trying to figure out where we were going. In the turn of the year, we decided at that time that we, well, what I would do is maybe we just move to Sioux Falls. Move back to Sioux Falls and I'd run the markets out of there and that, that would work. But deep down inside, there was something that just didn't feel right. So now we're procrastinating like I did with the speech, I guess. I guess I learned that too. And we decided... We decided that it was about March or April, so we didn't have a lot of time. So I decided that we would just go to Sioux Falls and we'd rent an apartment. Now, there's nothing wrong with Sioux Falls. I lived there for a long time. But I'll never forget this moment. We, 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 went, we went to the rental place, and we sat down with the lady, and we were talking about it. And I said, all right, fine, I'll take the apartment. 
And I'm sitting there with my wife, and I'm like, honey, I said, I don't know, is this it? I mean, we did all that. I mean, everything, when I started to go out on faith, I could talk for another hour on it, but everything fell into place. I mean, the house sold. Everything was going just perfect. Ah, honey, there's got to be something more than this, I said. So I sat there, and I said, you know what? If God isn't going to decide for me, then I guess I'll just decide. We'll just take the apartment. Maybe that's what we're supposed to do. Because when we sit there in faith, we're still asking for proof. So I decided, fine, I'll take the apartment, I told her. And it was like, gosh, it was like 1500 bucks a month, a couple thousand dollar deposit. It was a big commitment for us. She comes back. This is no lie. She comes back about five minutes later. She says, I'm sorry, Mr. Young, but for some reason my computer and printer just blanked on me. It absolutely doesn't work. I can't get it going. It'll take a tech a couple hours to come out here. I said, Dad, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. I said, just, just mail me the paperwork and yanked. And this, not a big deal. We're not in a huge hurry. I'll sign it and I'll send it back and we'll take the apartment. So she did. So on about a Tuesday or Wednesday, I got the paperwork. I signed everything. I wrote out the check. I said I put it in the envelope and I waited. I procrastinated again. I guess I did learn that from, from doing the speech. But I, I waited to the last moment. And then all of a sudden I got a call from our company, a recruiter in Arizona. And I had the opportunity, I was about ready to mail that. And I think what I was doing at that time is I was trying to force faith. I was trying to force a decision by something and I was forcing that and somebody stepped in that day, I believe in my mind and made that printer go off. Because I think they knew too, I was kind of, a, I was a banker at that time, so they knew I was kind of tight. So if I would have signed it, I probably wouldn't have went. You know, I would have stayed where I was at because I wouldn't have wasted the money. But that opportunity began an opportunity for me to take over a market of about 1.3 million people. And I was able to jump on that. And that was a hard decision. I had to make that on faith because the faith story was a little bit different. The problem was I had family. Now we're leaving family. It has a different dynamic. But I knew deep down inside that there was something more that I needed to do. There was something that was more powerful that was there. And I think somebody stepped in and helped me with that that day. And so I went on to take over a very large market because what I knew is on the other side of that was an opportunity for me to grow into something I wouldn't have been able to grow at where I was at. And I realized that time that it was just like the speech. I jumped into a fear. I jumped into my fear. I wouldn't be here today if I hadn't made that move. I wouldn't be doing the speaking that I'm doing today, the thing that I dearly loved. It's funny when you decide to follow faith and you don't ask for proof all the time in leadership, how things come around. And all of a sudden I get to stand here, ironically, 25 years later in front of you. 25 years ago I gave that speech that I thought was going to amount to nothing. And I realized in my life that I was going to jump and it was going to make all the difference. What I want to leave you with is that all of you get a blank slate. For you students that are leaving here, some of them it's in a year, some of it's in three years, doesn't matter, four years. You have a blank slate to be able to print or paint the leadership, the life that you want to be able to paint. You have that ability to draw whatever you want that to be. If you follow the four things of being fearless, being learners, jumping into things that people don't want to do, and not always asking for proof, you can paint any picture you want. You can have anything you want when you leave here from Wesleyan. It is a really a blank canvas if you truly, truly follow these four things. For some of us, seasoned, we've painted outside the lines a little bit. We've had things that have gone awry, people that have left us, things that haven't gone the way we've wanted to go. Our leadership has gone awry in some cases. Here's the key for us is that if you use those four things, the size of the mess on your canvas doesn't grow while the rest of your canvas does. You still, at any age, can paint the picture that you want. You can be anything you want. You can do everything you want because the best decisions are made in faith. The best decisions don't always have proof. I guarantee it. Just don't ask me for proof. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Um, inspirational and encouraging at the same time. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
So we're going to take a few moments uh, to ask Larry some questions. Um, I have some in my mind if, uh, if we don't have any right away. But are there any folks out there that want to ask Larry a question? No hecklers in the back. Surely his brother-in-law, Chris, has yeah, a question for him. Ask him. It can be anything from football to leadership. Yes, sir. Where do you live in Arizona? I live in Gilbert, Arizona, just outside southwest of Phoenix. Yep. Yes, Jared. The, uh, the boiling frog, the day uh, that I leapt, I leapt from the comfort of the corporate job and I went into the, uh, decided what I was going to do. I was sitting there and one day I decided, you know what, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to speak and I'm going to coach and, and I'm going to do business development strategy. And I decided that's where I was going to go. And uh, so I decided that day within about two hours that I was going to form my own business and that's what I was going to do. And I'm like, crap, what am I going to name this place? And I, I, didn't, I didn't want anything like Larry Young Consulting or anything of him. And so I, I formed the company Boiling Frog Development based on the parable of the boiling frog, which tells you that if you throw a frog in hot water, it'll sense the danger and jump out. But if you put a frog in cold water, slowly turn it up, the frog doesn't recognize that its environment is changing, which then becomes its demise. So after years in the corporate environment, when I decided I was going to go train leaders, what I wanted to focus on, Jared, is the fact that I wanted to train leaders to recognize that their environment has changed when they don't realize it, so they don't face the same demise. That's where the name came from. Question. Yeah. Okay, so we have a, a couple of our teams on our campus who are just struggling, and you were on part of a championship team for Dakota Wesleyan at one point, right? And it's hard when you're failing and you're picking yourself back up week after week to sort of get back out there, especially in rainy weather, cold, etc. What do we take from that? What can we learn from that time? Because obviously the 1992 football team didn't come from um, success right away. Yeah, so. I, th I think the, uh, a couple things I would tell if you're asking for the teams or the athletes and really for anybody in leadership. What I would tell you is most people don't realize, I believe I could be wrong, the memory fades, but the first two years that I was here, my freshman and sophomore year, we were five and five. And we had a lot of fun and we worked real hard and we had a real process in place. I don't know, I think we talked about a little bit, well, when the 92 season started, I don't know that any of us projected at that time that it would turn into that. I think that Chris would tell you too, just uh, that we were just a bunch of fun loving people that just loved playing ball. But what I would also tell you about leadership is that I think, Amy, the things that made us successful in 92 came from the pain of the first two years. And what people also don't realize is, and I told the classes this this morning, is that we were 10 and 0, but we could have easily been 5 and 5. I think we had maybe three overtime games, a last minute field goal, and Scotty Dorman picked off USF to stop their drive. And we could have easily been 5 and 5 that year. But when you stay with the process and you stay focused on the end result, you keep lifting, you keep pushing, or you keep practicing speeches, whatever your endeavor is, eventually something that will shoot out will be something beautiful. And that beauty came in the form of something that some of us guys get to remember forever. Yes? You gave a lot of great ones in your speech, but if you had one quote or one motto that you kind of live by, do you have one that really sticks with you over the rest? On the other side of fear is opportunity. It really is. And I tell you that from the truest of places because I struggled with that my whole life until all of a sudden I leapt into this position, what I'm doing now, and I realized that there was something in life that I could not only be great at, but I could be proud of. And that's when I knew that on the other side of fear was greatness. And it's true for all of us. Yes? What, what did DW do? The teachers. I mean, the teachers. I see Dave Mitchell still here. Uh, I'm going to talk to him afterwards. There was a couple couple things that he did that absolutely changed my life. He doesn't even know it. I know Farney just retired. I still, still remember breaking the bricks over him, and it didn't break. You remember that? Uh, Jerry, I see you're still here. I mean, your personal finance and some of those classes. The, the, the teachers made the difference. You know, the cool thing about Wesleyan that I remember, and I think it still rings true a little bit I'm here, is it's kind of like a big family. In a way, we may have our individualism, but at the end of the day, you're here to learn, you're here to grow, and everybody gets an opportunity to succeed because it's at a size that people can. That made all the difference. 
I will tell you when I left, I left just like everything in my life. I just kind of, I was in a habit of moving on. It isn't until later in life that you appreciate what was here. And that's those things, the teachers. Yes. I'm a pastor in this community, so faith is a big part of what I do. But it seems like our world more and more is demanding proof uh, over faith. How do you, how, what, what advice would you give to faith communities to help us to lift up that faith component? Well, yeah, so the, so the idea is that being in the faith community, people are always requiring proof. And, uh, and then how do you grow in that? In faith, is that is that fair enough? You know, I, I don't claim to be a pastor on TV, but I will tell you that I believe that my opening piece, which is that people have to understand the difference between faith and proof, and you have to be able to know which one motivates you. And so a lot of times there's things in life that we do need proof on. But the problem that people do, I think, in my opinion, this is just Larry Young's opinion in faith, is that a lot of times we try to reach to a scripture or a text and interpret it in the form to make proof for something that we want to believe in. And I think we do that the opposite way. I think what we have to do is be able to look at, let's say, scripture in the form of faith and be able to let that then guide us. The thing that you'll find, I spoke to a leadership group about this, we make decisions in the opposite format. What we really do is we make up our mind and then we find everything possible to justify why it's correct. There's studies I could cite to show this. This is real. But if you want to think about faith, then really at the end, you really have to think about looking at what you're going forward or having that faith and let the decisions fall where they are. Does that help? Yes. Um, what have been some of the best books that you've read or authors that you tend to, or typically tend to read? I've, um, gosh, I read 60, 70 books a year. Um, now I read a lot of sales, you know, and, and, and that type of thing because that's the world I play in. But there's a couple of them, uh, may or be of interest to some people. There's one called Willpower Doesn't Work. I love it. Uh, I love the book. Uh, because it, it, it's kind of that idea of I don't want to be fat, don't put cupcakes in the pantry. But what it really takes you do, yeah, yeah I should listen to that. Uh, <laughs> what, what, what it does is it takes you through the process of eliminating things that are in your life that totally take away from what your real goals are. I think that that's a real powerful one. One of them that I read, and I'm, I'm not uh, trying to, uh, Brown knows the teacher, but uh, uh, Pivot was a really good book that features our college in there. And I read that and wrote all over that. That was a fantastic book on being able to pivot and how Wesleyan has changed since I was here and the leadership. And uh, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a fantastic book. So those are a couple. There's a really good one for all of you. If you want something that's kind of lively, that'll, that'll spark you a little bit, it's called The Energy Bus. I can't think of that. Have you read that? Yeah. That's a fascinating one. It's a quick read told in parables of 10 stories. That's one I would really recommend for a lot of you. Yes. <coughs> Yes. What, what do you think is the most important thing to have? Any what? What do you think is the most important thing to have? Yeah, the, uh, so the question is, when you're leading the large uh, group of people, I think that there's a couple things that go with that, uh, and I learned it from Pat, was one was process. Process always follows and process engages people in the, in the way to do things. So once you've decided, the second piece is what I would have talked to Dr. Van Zee's class about, which is kind of that vision and strategy and that creative problem solving. So it depends on the level that you're managing. If you're on the front line, it's a little bit more process, or excuse me, a little bit more of the people management. As you rise in companies, it becomes more about the process, making sure that things are flowing. And then when you get to the highest level, then it circles back to people and relationships. And so if you can always make sure that you're building your networks, you're always focused on the day-to-day, -day, kind of like the football piece, the football piece, that makes a big piece of doing the same thing every day and then having that vision is a big part of that. Yeah? Yeah, good question. Others? All right, no toilet paper today. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Larry. Let's thank Larry one more time. Thank you all for coming today.